new series is The Command to Expand. The name of the new series is The Command to Expand. But today's title in that series is The Heart of God. I want to talk to you about the heart of God, about the nature of God. It's very difficult, it's very difficult to serve a God you don't understand. And lots of times we hear this quoted, uh, uh, that the ways of God, how does the scripture go? His thoughts, our thoughts are not his thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. And usually when someone quotes those scriptures, they usually say, we cannot understand God because his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But that's not what that scripture means. Even though his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, he does not say we can't know his ways. Right? So what makes it difficult to serve God is when you don't understand him. You don't know where he is, where he's going, what his heart is, what his desire is for the world, for the planet, for you, for your house, for your children, your body, your mind, your life, your pocketbook, doesn't matter what it is. We get, we get uh, you cannot serve someone for a long period of time unless you know why you're serving him. You cannot take care of crying babies for a long time unless you know why you've been given those babies. You can't stay in a marriage long unless you know why the marriage was created. You, you can't stay in a job long. You can't, you can't uh, have a prospering business unless you understand the whys of why you're in business and who that business helps, right? So it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to serve a God that you really don't understand because you can't, you can't plan a meeting with him. You can't go sit in his office, per se. You can't, you can't, you can't open up, uh, what well, some of us think, you cannot open up his directive and read it. But we can open up the directive of God and understand what his plan is. And we have to set up the next season for our life built upon what God wants. Not what you've been through, not what's happened, not what other people are saying, and not even about how you feel. You have to set your life up and its future based upon his plan. And everything that's not a part of his plan, <clears throat> you have to simply throw it away. Is that all right? So go with me, go, go with me to Exodus, um, Exodus 33. Obviously, this is the story of Moses. Moses has, um, I'll preface it and then we'll start reading. Moses has uh, been called by God. He goes and frees the children of Israel, and now he's brought them to the place where they're supposed to meet God. He's getting ready to take them to meet the God he met. He met God at a burning bush on a mountain, and now his job is to bring the people back to where he saw God, right? So he's up there talking to God. He's getting the Ten Commandments. He comes down from the mountain, and by the time he comes down, he's been up there too long because you can't serve a God you don't understand too long. So he comes down off the mountain, and just in a few days, they built a golden calf. They are now sleeping around with one another. They changed their music. They changed their clothing. They changed everything because you cannot serve a God you don't understand very long. Okay, so uh, you, you, you can't be faithful to something very long unless you understand the nature of God. And then the, the, part, the part I'm trying to make, and I'll just make it so I can, you know, it's like rice underneath your dentures. Uh, so you can't succeed at something that you can't do for a long time. You, you have to do it over and over and over and over again consistently before you can succeed in it. Am I right? So if you can't do something for a long time, you'll never succeed. But if you don't know what and why you're doing something, you won't do it for a long time, therefore you won't succeed. So people who are not successful, some of us can blame it on the devil. That's probably about 1.1%. <laughs> the rest of us 99% people, we can't blame him. We can blame ourselves because we're not learning to be consistent. We don't know why we're doing something. Amen? 
So Moses come down, they have a calf. Moses gets mad. He's got these tablets in his hand, the Ten Commandments. So he throws them, they break apart, right? And lots of people die that day. But then God calls Moses back up the mountain because these commandments are important. And even Moses needs to know, not God, not what do you want me to do, but why am I doing it? What is the purpose for this whole thing? So that's where we pick up in Exodus 33. I'm telling you to take notes. It'll change your life. Okay, chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. And then listen to what the Lord says. Now I'm going to send an angel before you, and what is he going to do? He's going to drive out the Canaanites, read them, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Havites, Jebusites. He's going to drive them all out. He's going to drive them out before you. So go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. Then God says these words. Read it with me. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you if I got to hang out with you. If I, if I got, if I got, if, 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 I, if, if I can tolerate you, as long as I'm not in the room with you. Okay? I can, I, can, I, can, I can deal with you. I can handle you as long as it's with a long handle. Now, but if I got to be with you, I know I'm supposed to help you, but you're so stiff-necked. You know, to turn your head, I got to turn your whole body. In other words, y'all, you don't know what stiff-necked means. Oh, I'm working too hard. Stiff-necked, the opposite of stiff-necked is being led by the eye. You have a parent that don't have to, you're not stiff-necked, the opposite of being led by your eye. In other words, your parent can look at you like my daddy would from the pulpit. He would just look, and I could interpret. Sit down, shut up. That was, that's first level. Second level, I could interpret you in real trouble. Just by his look, third level is I'm going to beat the hell out of you when you get home. <laughs> now, I knew he didn't have to say nothing. I knew what he said with his eyes. And after a few of them whoopings, because you think after daddy is listening to the pastor and he's dancing around and being baptized in the Holy Ghost, you would think he would forget about the eye he gave me. No, no. When you get home, daddy would whoop me. So after two or three of those, I just let him look at me, and I knew what to do. The opposite of that is stiff neck. Stiff neck means this. When, when your father speaks, when your father speaks, if you're obedient, you can just turn. If you're stiff necked, you don't turn. So he has to keep calling you, but you still don't turn. So he has to give you a situation that turns your whole body. before he gets your attention. Which means if God has to turn your whole body, by the time you turn, you in deep kimchi. I mean, you in real trouble. You in trouble by then that only, when, when people say, I heard God's voice loud, I know what that means. I know that, that he's been whispering for years. If you hear God's voice audibly, it means he's about done with you. It means he can't lead you by his spirit. You're stiff-necked. So he has to turn your whole body. He has to take a car away. He has to, he has to allow something. He doesn't beat you, but he has to allow the, the quality control person in the kingdom who's the devil. You know, he's quality control. Because after you talk, he just gives you over to the devil to be tested. That's quality control. So you don't pass quality control. You're stiff-necked. So God says, I'm not going with you because I can't tolerate you. I'm going to bless you with a long hand. Moses starts talking. Listen. Now when, now, when the people heard this, they became distressed. I would be too. God's sending us, so where he not going? 
Now, you're going to tell me to go, but you're not going to go with me. They began to mourn. No one put on their ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a minute, I might destroy you. Now, oh man, that's deep. Even for a minute, if I go with you, I might destroy you. So now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now, here's the point. I want you to read this with your spirit, not with your mind. Now, listen to what Moses says. Now, Moses used to take a tent. Listen. He used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp from some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp, and wherever, whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood in the entrance of their own tents because they want to know what God's saying. When Moses, Moses, uh, until he entered the tent, as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of the cloud would come down and stand, would stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Now listen to this. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of his tent. And read verse 11. Read it loud. Read it loud. The Lord, speak to Moses. Read that again. One more time. And the next part of the verse. As a man, this is intimacy. God has never put these verses in the Bible before except with Moses. That he talked to Moses face to face as a man talks to his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young age, Joshua, stayed in the tent. That's a whole nother sermon. God is talking to Moses face to face. So then why do we have verse 12? Let's get to verse 12. You there? So Moses said to the Lord, read it. You have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, listen to what Moses says. Now, now listen. The Bible says that God talks to Moses face to face as a friend talking to a friend. But Moses is saying, I don't know you. And you're trying to tell me to lead these people, and I don't know you. How can they know you, and you don't talk to them the way you talk to me, but you want me to lead them somewhere, but I still don't know your ways? What do you do? Why, you, why do you do it? How do you do it? Your mind. Where are you going? What's your modus operandi? I don't want to have to pray every time I got a decision to make. I want to know your nature. I want to know what you're thinking. I don't want to know what, I want to know what your spirit is. I want to know how you operate, your modus operandi. I want to know what you do in your sleep and why and how. Because otherwise, I cannot lead these people. And you can't lead your own life. It is virtually impossible for you to lead your own life and you don't know God. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about being converted. So Moses says, listen to what he says. He says, teach me your ways. So that what? So that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And then he says to God, and about that destroying them thing, about that killing them thing. Now, I just want to remind you, this is your nation. These are not my people. <laughs> so if you're going to kill them, just know, Pharaoh and everybody in Egypt, they're going to say that you could bring them out, but you didn't have the power to bring them in. And a God who can save you but not bring you into kingdom 
Is no God worth serving? Am I yelling? Maybe I should. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm at the top of my register, so let me bring that down. Remember, this is your nation. So the Lord replied. Okay, this is the Lord talking to Moses. Okay, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, listen, Moses is after something. Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, we ain't going. So let's just make that clear. You're not going to send me somewhere and then tell me you're not going. That's like your wife, that's like you telling your wife, honey, I want to do this. And she just says, go ahead. That means <laughs> you zone your own. <laughs> that's the short interpretation. Go ahead, baby. But you deal with the fallout. Don't call me. Don't ask me nothing. He says, we're not going without you. Then he says, Verse 16, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me? What else is going to set me apart from all other people on the face of the earth? Moses understood something. We don't have time for today. But what's going to distinguish me and your people from all the other nations on the, world, on the earth if you don't go with us? And the Lord said to Moses, okay, okay. I will, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses gets to really what he, what he really wanted. Moses says, okay then, all right. It really wasn't your ways I wanted to know. I mean, I don't just want to know why you do something how you do something, and how you make your decisions. But I want to know you. And I want to know all of you. Glory means I want to see your full weight. Everything you are, I want to see it. Every, everything, not just why, what, wins, but I, I want to know the real essence of you. I want to be on the inside of you. I want to know you like the Son and the Holy Spirit know you. He says, show me your glory. Glory means full weight. It means everything. Show me everything. But God said to Moses, I, I can't show you everything. Because if I show you everything, I'll have to kill you. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Moses. This is very important. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will cause my goodness, underline it. I'm going to cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, my nature. You see it? The Lord in your presence, my nature. I'm going to show you me. I'm going to come down, and I'm going to show you me. And, and then the Lord says, so that nobody, me or you, can say of God and Moses, or of God and Catherine Kuhlman, or God and Smiggles with a Word, or God and Dr. Monroe, none of us can say, well, God, why are you showing her? You didn't show me that. And God simply says, I'll show mercy on who I want. It's none of your business. Okay, let me read it, not paraphrase it. Because <laughs> y'all be getting mad. I, I see your face. I want to hear from God for myself. Well, you're not mature enough. You can't drink coffee all the time and hear from God. You can't cuss one minute and then be praying and trying to hear from God. You can't disobey all day and then get in trouble and say, Lord, help me. He ain't there. God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, I'll have compassion on you, but you cannot see my face. You can't, I can talk to you face to face, but you can't see my face. For no one may see me and live. Nobody can see me and live. 
So listen to what God says. Then the Lord said, listen, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. In the Hebrew, that means the rock. It's Jesus. You can stand on this place, the rock, Jesus. And when my, listen, my full glory is going to pass you by. But while my glory is passing you by, I'm going to put you in the secret place in this rock. Inside this rock, this is before Jesus, I'm going to put you in this rock, and while I pass by you, you can't see my face, so I'm going to cover your face as I pass by you, and once I'm by you, with my face turned, I'm going to take my hand away, and you're going to see my hind parts. Now, this scripture does not mean God had back. It does not mean that Moses is going to see the booty of God. It does not mean that Moses is going to look at God's robe or God's train. It, it, it does not mean Moses got to see God walk. That, that's, not, that's, not, that's, that's, that's not what this scripture means. Is that all right with y'all? Did I go somewhere you couldn't go? Okay. That, that, is, that, is, that is not what it means. It means... God says, I'm going to let you see in the original my hind parts. In other words, Moses, I'm going to show you what, why, how I did things. And I'm going to let you see my nature so that if you know what, why, and how I did things, you will also know your future. You will be, be, you will be able to predict me. You will be able to see not just what I did and why I did it and how I did it. You'll be able to see that me as God, once I start something, I never stop until it's finished. I'm king. So if I, if I show you what, why, and how, you will know that no matter what's going on, you will still be able to keep the word I gave you and lead these people. If you know what I wanted, you won't be discouraged when you're up against the Red Sea. If you know why I'm doing something, you won't be discouraged in front of Pharaoh. If you know how I'm doing it, you will not be bewildered when you're entering into the promised land. Amen. Does that make sense at all? So God makes Moses this promise. I'm going to let you see me, my hind part. Do you know what that is? I was meditating on this, and I said, God, if you showed Moses your ways, what did you show him? And the Lord took me to Genesis 1. And I'm telling you, you can read the Bible every day for years, and just some things will hit you on the side. And don't tell me if you knew. Don't tell me if God told you before he told me. I don't need to hear that right now. <laughs> mess with me. No, really, really, it's no problem. But God reminded me, he said, now, where do you think Genesis came from? I said, Moses wrote it. And the Lord said, but Moses wasn't there. So how did Moses write Genesis? He didn't have any tablets, Genesis 1 and 2 especially. He didn't have any tablets. He didn't have any stories passed down to him. Because, you know, Adam and Eve, they forgot about Eden. They didn't live there anymore. So the Lord said, you need to read Genesis 1 again. Because I showed Moses my hind parts. I showed him where I've been. I showed him why I did it. So now Moses knew. Moses knew what I wanted. Moses knew where I was going. How do you hit a rock and tell water to come out of it unless you're sure these people cannot die in the wilderness. Y'all don't understand. How do you stand in front of a river that's overflowing and step in it when it's overflowing unless you know what God's going to do? See, so here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Too many saints are trying to do simple and unimportant things. Too many Christians are not, let me get up here, too many saints are not trying to do anything that takes the God factor. 
So we've never had to be pressured into expecting God, into praying, into seeking, into knowing what God wants. Because we do simple stuff. We pay the bills. We meet our bills. We get jobs. We don't get purpose. We get jobs. We have babies. We don't raise sons. We get by. We don't stretch. But Moses knew, I can stretch as far as I can stretch. Because no matter how far I stretch, God is where I stretch to. And when you begin to understand that you can't go anywhere God hasn't been, you can't face a day God didn't make, you can't have an issue God didn't know about. And when you start living like that, normal, mediocre people be, oh, she's a woman of faith. No, she just know what God wants. She know where God's going. She can predict. How did somebody ask me last week? It, I got a call from Pastor Strong, and Pastor Strong says, I'm bringing a bunch of preachers up there. I said, up where? He said, I'm bringing them to Omaha. I said, wow, where are you going to be? I'll come over and listen. He said, I'm going to be at your church. I said, okay, you know, when you listen to fathers, you just have to stop and let them talk, right? And I said, okay, tell me. Just tell me. Give me all the details. He said, Martin, when I came and saw what God did for you, he said, I know where you come from. He said, I met with you. Y'all don't, y'all don't remember. But he said, I was in that cold, that cold gymnasium, that cold gymnasium. He watched us set up chairs. He said, I know where you're from. He said, I'm bringing them to see. He says, I'm bringing them to see because I want them to see what God can do for them. And I simply said, yes, sir, what are your dates? So for three days, Pastor Strong's going to be here with ministers from around the region. He's bringing them here to see you. But the big deal is simple. What's happening here is no big deal, really. It's really a knucklehead guy like me who's able to be led by his eye. It don't really matter. How did you do it? What if it hadn't happened? Ain't no big deal to me. What if it had failed? What if you didn't get the building? What if you can't pay for the building? I don't care. It's his thing. If God can't pay for it, I will go back to the hotel. And I will rent a room, and if y'all leave because God failed, I'll start with 30. It don't make no difference. Shoot. But it comes down to, God, I done told people we're buying this building. Martin, did I tell you? No, you didn't tell me to buy the building. I saw the building. I thought it would look good in the hands of kingdom citizens. The building's sitting up there on top of the hill, and I just think it'd be good. It'd be good if you owned it. So I told him we're going to buy it. Now, what's God going to do? <laughs> no, really. What choice does he have? He's got somebody now full of faith and telling everybody his God can do it. Okay, mama and daddy, you know what it's like when your kids were little, and they told everybody, oh, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. My mama, my, oh, my mama cooked 24-7. She cleaned you. She don't ever sleep. My mama is superwoman, wonder woman. And when, her, when your daughter brought her friends over, you worked hard to stand up to that image. <laughs> What's God going to do after you get through bragging on him and stepping out? Well, God didn't tell me. He don't have to tell you everything. You can know what God wants. So I went back to the first book Moses wrote hundreds of years after Genesis happened. 
This is this was amazing to me. You don't seem enthused. But this this was amazing to me. The first verse, I just never read it like this. He said, now, read the first chapter, Martin. Read it all in Hebrew. Now, I'm telling you right there, that whole chapter in Hebrew took me about a week. Because <laughs> I don't read Hebrew. So I got to go to all my books. Okay, then what does that word mean? What does that word mean? What does that word mean? But I read the first verse in Hebrew. Can I give it to you? The first verse says, the first verse says God. It, in the beginning, in the beginning is not the first verse of Genesis 1. The first verse is in the Hebrew, God, or El. And that's it. It's El, period. Okay, okay. The first verse says, God. And that's it. And I'm like, well, Moses, what does that mean? It means God. How do you explain God? What do you say? How do you put words around? He's God from everlasting to everlasting, never was, always is. He wasn't created. He doesn't exist. He is. So how do you describe him? You don't. So he just simply said, God, L. Who are you? He asked, Moses asked later, who are you? So I can tell Pharaoh. He said, I am that I am. I mean, I don't know how to, I, I, I mean, I, I, I am. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you, Moses. Just tell him I am sent you. Well, God, I don't know how to, here, just take this stick. Just take this stick and, you know, go, go on in there, and when it gets rough, throw the stick down, point it, something, and I'll show up. You know, I am, I'll show up. And then they'll get it. They'll get it when the stick, you know. When I show up in the stick, they, they'll know. So just go on. I don't know how to explain myself to you. I don't know how to give myself no name. I don't know how to describe myself. So he just says, God. Then the first verse says, God then created the heavens and the earth. Stop. God created the heavens and the earth. Number one, God always is, not was. He always is, which means God was there before he created the heavens. That is so um, deep we can't even talk about it. He created the heavens, then he created the earth. Now, here's the question. The next phrase, read it with me. Now the earth was formless, a void, and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Stop. Now, Moses sees something that we haven't heard described. Whenever God creates something, what's wrong with it? When he creates something, what's missing? Nothing. When God makes something, when he's done, it's perfect. It's, perfect. it's, it's, it's eternal perfection. It doesn't need any work. It doesn't need, it doesn't need anything repaired. It doesn't need, so, so when we read scriptures, if we, you got to understand God. So when you understand God and you know when he finishes something, it's complete, then you would never think that when Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you'll be there also, you know he's not talking about heaven. What in heaven needs to be prepared? <coughs> Let me, I need to find somebody sitting in their lap. You, there ain't nothing broke in heaven. Jesus didn't go to heaven after he died to fix the plumbing till we come. He's not up there fixing the roof. He's not up there cooking. <laughs> Heaven's perfect. The place he's preparing for us is a new earth. I better not teach what I should preach, so let me keep going. So in between the first phrase in Genesis 1 and the second phrase, something happens. Because when God created the heavens and the earth, it was perfect. So the Lord, as I'm looking up every word in this one scripture, I looked up the word was. 
You do it when you get home. I looked it up, man. It blew my mind. The word was means became. It means in the process of time. Th this is so groundbreaking to me. J just act like it's new to you and good. I mean, like a new dessert you never had. When you know when your toes start tingling. <laughs> now, now, listen now. The heaven and earth was flawless, but now it was formless. It became. It wasn't created formless. It became formless, and it wasn't empty. It became empty. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. It wasn't dark. God is the God of light. But it became dark. And in this state of godlessness, in this state that God did not create it to be, it says that the Holy Spirit is just hovering over the earth. Not impacting the earth, just hovering over it, waiting for something to happen. Waiting for God to do something. You be, I'm telling you. Waiting for something to happen because this earth, the Holy Spirit knows the earth is not supposed to be like this. So the Holy Spirit hovers, hovers. He, he's just hovering. I don't know how long. I wish I could tell you. I don't know how long it was. He's just hovering. And then... And then, these words, and God said, let there be light, not plural, singular. Okay, let me, let me, let me give you this, and now, don't you, don't you bring your Sunday school teacher here to talk to me. Talk to me. Okay, because <laughs> I know you're going to go back and talk to your Sunday school. You know what that man said? God said, let there be light, singular. And there was light. And God saw, as Moses could explain it, and God saw the light that it was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Listen. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Now, I want you to go over, because I know this is going to hit you. This is going to be good. I hope it don't hit you too hard. Okay. So go over to what is it? Verse uh, uh, 14. Verse 14. Does this feel like Bible study? Okay. Go to verse 14. You there? Read verse 14 with me aloud. And God said, let there be lights. Stop. Plural. Oh, Jesus. Okay. The first time God said light, he wasn't talking about sun, moon, stars. <laughs> he wasn't talking about luminous bodies. The first time God said, let, let there be light, he created, write it down, he created, he, he created time and revelation. The first time he said light, God himself became the light for the planet. There ain't no sun. There's no moon. There are no stars. He created them later. He created them in a different day. This day... He himself created time. God created time. The first thing he created was time. The first thing he wanted us to have was time. So that not eternity first, but time. So that God could make appointments for us. 
He does not live in time. He lives outside of time, but he made time for us so that he could schedule things. So that he could put things on our calendar in the eons. You weren't just born. You were planned. You're not just married, my brother. You're not just married. You're not just married. And even if you're sick of her, you're not just married. You have children with her, not just to have children. This is not procreation. There is a reason that you're married. There is a reason to keep your family together. Why well, ain't feeling it no more? Then feel it. Why well, I can't make myself. Okay, I, I know I'm stuck here, so let me just say it so I can get out. You know you can make yourself do a lot of things by your decision. Amen. You can decide to do it, and then your mind and your body will follow. Yeah. And just like you decided not to be in love no more, you can decide to be in love. Yeah. Okay, I'll get out of there. Now, you can send me an email on that one, but I'm going to fire back at you. Outside of this, it'd be hard. <laughs> Let me get back to where I was. Hmm. Okay, girl, he might not have been the man you thought he was going to be. <laughs> okay? He didn't turn out to be what you thought he was going to be. But that ain't got nothing to do with eternal purpose. Can I tell you, <laughs> how much time I got? Can I tell you why the Muslims, the Jews, the Mormons, these sects of people, we're not a sect, we're a nation. Okay. But let me tell you why they're beating us everywhere. They're beating us in economy. We can call the Mormons a cult. They stay married. They raise and finance their children's futures. And we Christians pray all the time <laughs> with no power. You know why? Because Muslims aren't called a sect. They're called a nation. Israel's not called a sect. They are a nation. They know that they are here to build a nation. We're the only ones that are clueless. That we are a nation of diverse people coming together under one flag. And in our nation, there are just things we don't do. I didn't say there are th things we don't want to do. There are a lot of things we want to do. We just don't do them. Because it's not permitted in our nation. And just like in our, just like in our city, you break the laws of the city, we put you in jail. I don't care what, don't care what color your skin is or what kind of testimony you got. You break the law, you need to go to jail. The same happens in the kingdom. You break the law, many of you are in this room right now shackled. It's like in jail. Okay, let me get back to light because that, that was too much. Light. Okay, listen. I don't, I don't know if you're reading, you should Google speed of light. You should Google light, not, not from a Christian point of view, but from a scientist point of view. They said five years ago, finally, they have given up on numbering the galaxies. That mathematically, it is now mathematically impossible to give a number to galaxies, not stars. Galaxies. They say that the universe is still moving and expanding at the speed of light. So that there are no instruments that can be created that would ever go to the end of the galaxy. And finally, they finally know that a human, no human being will ever see the ends of the galaxy. Even traveling at light speed, you would be a million years old before you got to the edge of the galaxy, that there are stars we see at night that don't even exist. 
They burned up years ago, but the light we still see as if they are there. There are as many galaxies in the universe as there are blades of grass on the planet. Wrap your mind, not lawns, not acres, blades of grass on the planet, there are that many galaxies. God says to Moses, Moses, the first thing I did for you is I created time. In the word light is not just where God's been, but where he's going. Okay, here's, here's a scripture you might need to write down. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. You know Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's a time to sleep, there's a time to be awake, there's a time to be poor, there's a time to be rich. God said there's a time. And at the end of that whole discourse, Solomon says, listen to what he says about God. You there? This is important. You there? He has made everything beautiful during its appointments. In its time, everything God wants for you has a time. Everything he's created for you has a time. But he says at the end of that, but even though there is an appointed time, he has set eternity. Okay, y'all need to read it. Let's read it, the whole verse. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has also set eternity so that I may not know what God is doing, but I know it's coming. God created light, which is time. He created revelation so we could know him. And then he said, I'm going to put now eternity in your heart. You can't dream about something you don't already have. I'm going to say it again. I'm going I'm to say it like Mother Wells down on Zetus Road in Mississippi on the dirt road. Sugar, you can't pray for something you got. You can't have a desire in your heart, your mind, that God doesn't have in your times. He put eternity in your heart. So even though you know, I'm not there now, but I am there now. And I don't have to wait till I get there to act like I am there. I had one pair of jeans when I finally started to like girls in high school. One pair of jeans. My sister from Chicago sent them to me. We had no money for no jeans. She sent me a pair of jeans, Chicago style. Girl, I washed them jeans every night. One time I got me about 50 cents and I sent them to the cleaners. Y'all know you send them to the cleaners? And they put that starch in them. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about back in the day when they put real starch in them. Like when you sat down, the jeans were still sitting down when you got up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Them jeans be crinkled up in the back because they had so much starch in them. I told my sister, I said, blow my hair out. If y'all don't know, this is, okay, all right, I'll, I'll get you. You know, this is 76. I mean, I couldn't afford no thing where you could perm. You do it permanently. No, get that straight and comb. Heat it up medium, blow it out. I'm going to show you a picture in a few months. Have my hair blowed out. Walk up in school with them jeans on. They say, you got them same jeans on. I said, I know. But in today's vernacular, ain't I'm clean? No, I'm clean. You know I'm clean. I don't, I know where I'm at. I know this morning, I know this morning, I had to because they left the cheese unwrapped. I know I had to stand on the knife 
to get the government cheese to cut. I know that. I know the baloney, the rind of it, that little red. I know it's stuck to some meat. I know I got to put it between my teeth and pull on it. I know that. <laughs> I know the eggs that came from the government. I know they ain't real. I know they powdered. Just, I know what I had for breakfast. But what I had for breakfast ain't got nothing to do with where I'm going. So I'm going to dress like my tomorrow. Young men, you don't let your pants sag because you're not going to look like that tomorrow. And if that's what you got to do to let the girls like you, that girl that likes boogie to booty hanging out, that ain't the one to take to the White House. That ain't the one who can handle a million dollars. That ain't the one who can go to hell and back with you. She may, she may not to you be the prettiest girl in the school, but you need a woman with some substance. And I pray what happened to me happened to you. <laughs> Beautiful girl with all of them, all boys on campus looking at. But smart too. I hope you get one of them. <laughs> Who knows what her business is and how to handle it. Amen. Are there two men that got one of them? <laughs> Talk to me, Matthew. You got one, Matt? Oh, yeah. They're few and far between. Girl, it ain't your new weave. It ain't no new perm. It ain't no makeup. Now, he think he looking for that. It ain't no certain body shape. He needs something else. And he don't know it till he see it. Some of y'all, and I'm meddling, I know I am. But some of y'all trying to become something your husband don't want. Or the man who's looking for you, he don't want what you're trying to be. I need to lose 25 pounds. No, he's looking for the extra. <laughs> OK. All right, then. <laughs> you lose 25 pounds, he just passed you in the mall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Moses. <laughs> Let's finish up with this for today. Okay, so watch Moses. Watch him. The first time God meets Moses, he is tending the sheep on the backside of the desert. He only knows the system of Pharaoh. He was a Hebrew, but not brought up with the Hebrew people. He was an Egyptian for all intents and purposes. He doesn't know this God. So Moses now meets God. This is, this is Exodus 3. And so when Moses meets God, he doesn't know it's God. It's a bush. Let, let me... It's a bush that's on fire. And the Bible says that Moses didn't turn aside to see God. It, it literally, let me just read it. Moses was tending the flock. This, this is Exodus 3 and 1. He was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He didn't even know where he was. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire, from within a bush. Now watch this. Moses saw what? Though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, what is this thought? Read it. I will go over and see this strange sight. I want to know why the bush is not burning up. 
I don't want to talk to no angel. I don't want to see God. I don't even know who God is. I want to know why this bush is burning. Bishop Tudor told us years ago. The bush was burning and not being consumed because eternity came where the bush was. And in eternity, there is no time. But in order for the bush to burn, it needed time. Bishop Tudor said simply, the bush had no time to burn. Because wherever there is eternity, when eternity invades time, time cease. All other laws stop. Okay, let me give you another one. Later on, <laughs> oh, geez. later on in like Exodus what, uh, 34 or so, Moses goes back up to see God. He's up there 40 days this time in the presence of God. And when he came down, his face was shining. His hair was white. His beard was white. In 40 days, he aged. But not while he was with God. It was when he left the presence of God. In other words, when you start walking with God, he takes you so much further, so much faster than normal life. So that when you walk with God and you step back into time, you're praying in the Holy Spirit and fasting and consecrating for 21 days. And you look the same. You look the same, but you're in eternity. Then you step out of eternity and go to work. And now you got wisdom you didn't have. Your hair is gray, not necessarily gray. You're smarter, you're wiser, you're on top of your game, your management level. You can do more than you were doing before. If you're a teacher, you got revelation. If you're a pastor, you're at a whole nother level. If you're a wife or, or you're raising your kids, you're, you're just at a whole nother place. Because you've stepped out of eternity and into eternity. Here's, I was going to leave this with you to think about, but I'll just tell you. How did the earth change from perfect to being void? Hmm? How did that happen? The Bible tells us how it happened. It tells us in Isaiah 14. It tells us how it happened. And if you get this, you won't de be defeated in anything you do this week. Isaiah 14 and 12, this is how it happened. Here's how it reads. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, Lucifer. Son of the dawn, you've been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the, <laughs> to the depths of the pit. Now listen, listen to verse 16. So those who see you will stare at you. They will ponder your fate. And this is what they will say. Is this the man who shook the... You see it? Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world... Here it is. Who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. This is how it happened. God made the earth and the heavens. It was perfect. And the Bible says that Satan had a thought. Now let me clear this up before you go home. People talk about a fight in heaven. No such thing. The devil got in a fight with God. You lost your mind. That kind of teaching, you hear somebody say that, 
You get your hat and your coat. 